Thank you, esteemed faculty, for your valuable insights. We request you all to kindly collect your mementos from the registration desk. For the next session, may we invite Dr. Sanjay Joshi, sir, Dr. Suman Keethi, ma'am, Dr. B.K. Singh, sir, and Dr. B.K. Tripathi, sir, on the dais to moderate the session on managing hyperglycemia in kidney disease and on managing in-hospital hyperglycemia. Hypertension and hyperglycemia are two villains of causing uh, kidney disease, chronic kidney disease. We have already discussed the importance of treating hypertension in the uh, last session, but now I am inviting a very uh, educated uh, speaker uh, for discussing hyperglycemia and kidney diseases. And he is no other than Dr. Bhupan Burman from All India Institute of Medical Sciences, Guwahati. So, Dr. Burman, please uh, tell us something about hypertension, sorry, hyperglycemia and kidney disease. Thank you. Thank you, Chairperson. Uh, good morning, uh, all. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank Dr. Anupam, Dr. Ashok for inviting me for this uh, wonderful academic session. So, in the next 15 minutes, I'll uh, briefly discuss on uh, managing hyperglycemia in kidney disease. My uh, previous speaker, Dr. Abhishek, has uh, beautifully covered some of the important issues in relation to management of diabetes and the prevention of uh, kidney disease, nephropathy in uh, diabetes. Uh, I'll give some uh, important uh, take home salient points regarding <coughs> sorry, practical management of uh, diabetes in uh, presence of kidney disease and uh, or nephropathy. So uh, as you have learned that uh, CKD is occurring um, uh, almost Diabetes prevalence is now almost 537 million people worldwide, and it's expected to increase to 784 million by year 2045. And prevalence of kidney disease is quite high. It's around more than 25 percent, and it has been estimated that 40 percent of people with diabetes will develop CKD during their lifetime. It's the most common cause of kidney failure, requiring kidney transplantation and dialysis worldwide. Uh, not even not in India, like in USA, USA one on Every five adults with diabetes is not aware of their diagnosis, and even like the awareness of CKD is even lower. With nine of ten individuals unaware of having underlying CKD, including two of five having severe CKD, they don't know, they are not aware about their kidney problem. So, uh, how to define CKD is the persistent EGFR of less than 60 and or albuminuria. As uh, Abhishek has discussed, there are two different pathways, so we are defining defining CKD in two basic uh, under mechanisms. One is albuminuria, and another one is EGFR. And, or with other markers of kidney damage like hemasuria or structural abnormality. And the persistence of these abnormalities of more than three months required to diagnose CKD. So how to, this is the, the important slides. This is uh, how to screen, when to screen, and what to do. So uh, in type one diabetes, has started a little bit late, so uh, okay, you should start screening five years after the diagnosis, then early. And in type 2 diabetes, it's early starting at the diagnosis. As you know that most of the type 2 diabetes, they present with complication. How to screen? You can go for albuminin creatinine ratio and EGFR. And suppose if we get positive result, what to do with positive result? Evaluate possible temporary or superior cause. Suppose patient is having diabetes along with urinary tract infections. So you treat the infection with if albuminuria is due to UTI. Then you treat the UTI and then accordingly you follow up the patients. And only persistent proteinuria or persistent low EGFR is will define CKD. And if it is CKD, then initiate evidence-based treatment. How, what defines CKD is a persistent urine SCR of more than 30 milligram per day. Other evidence of kidney disease, as I have said, there is hemasuria, structural damage, obstructive urobathy, or persistent EGFR of less than 60 ml per minute per one thousand. And always uh, try to find out the cause of CKD other than diabetes in diabetic patients, like 
were expecting to have nephropathy and retinopathy in patients of diabetes if patient develop nephropathy. And suppose patient is not having retinopathy and having proteinuria, then you have to find out the other cause of proteinuria or nephropathy. In that, in those conditions, maybe patient require renal, renal biopsy. And then patient is having, suppose, uh, some other diseases, secondary causes of nephropathy, like patient is having lupus nephritis, patient is having other autoimmune diseases, then try to find out and try to treat the other causes. In the absence of such red flags, CKD is usually attributed to the type 2 diabetes mellitus. So on practical note, in patient with diabetic nephropathy, should be evaluated for retinopathy. If retinopathy is not there, evaluate for the secondary cause. And if there is other causes of, possible causes of nephropathy, try to evaluate and uh, treat the secondary causes. So this is the, uh, the classification criteria of CKD. We uh, defined based on the cause, based on EGFR, and based on albuminuria. And based on EGFR, it will, it's from G1 to G5. And based on albuminuria, it is A1, A2, A3. Why it is important to do all these tests? Because if in early stage, we may have to the screen. And as the, in the previous lecture, it was uh, discussed regarding the preventive management. Maybe you can consider for preventive management. And in advanced tests, early referral to nephrologist may helpful to prevent the further complications or requirement of dialysis or transplantation. Regarding target, uh, what should be the target in patient with CKD? So as a gen, uh, general principle, hemo glycosylated hemoglobin should be the therapeutic target. Now question is, in patient with advanced kid, uh, kidney disease, like in stage 4 or stage 5 chronic kidney disease, A1C may not be totally reliable. Or suppose patient is having frequent hypoglycemic events, in those conditions, we may consider for continuous glucose monitoring or cell monitoring blood glucose. Regarding glycosylated hemoglobin, what should be a target? Again, it depends on the multiple factors and should be individualized. We uh, cannot go for strict glycemic control in patients with advanced kidney disease, in severe kidney failure, in patients with multiple comorbidities, patients suppose prone to develop hypoglycemia. In those group of patients, we cannot consider for very strict control. But on the other way, if patient is young and we are having goal for preventive glycemic and uh, resources for treatment of available, uh, treatment of hypoglycemia is available. In those conditions, maybe you can consider for strict glycemic control of A1C less than 6.5 percent. So target is glycosylated hemoglobin and that uh, should be individualized based on the patient profile. Now what drug to be selected other than insulin? So uh, regarding metformin, if we see the different parameters like progression to CKD, atherosclerotic, cardiovascular disease, heart failure, glucose lowering efficacy, hypoglycemic event, weight effect, and cost, metformin should be the first line of drug as it has multiple advantages in the, uh, cardiovascular risks, hypoglycemic events, and the cost. SGLT2 inhibitor has effect to <coughs> prevent the progression to CKD. <coughs> we know that it is the drug of choice for nowadays for dilated cardiomyopathy with heart failure. Glucose lowering efficacy is good and hypoglycemic events are low and weight loss, weight loss effect is there, but only consideration for SGLT2 is the cost. DPP2 inhibitor in the, we don't have studies for cardiovascular death. There are one group of DPP for inverted succagliptin have additional risks for heart failure. Glucose lowering efficacy is intermediate. Hypoglycemic event definitely low because it is uh, food dependent. Weight effect is neutral, cost is again high. Insulin I'll not go because it is uh, uh, if patients afford and if patient is acceptable, compliable, then definitely drug of choice for chronic kidney disease. Sulfonuria, we should avoid in presence of CKD because of uh, hypoglycemic events. 
Glitazone, again, the patient with heart failure and all should avoid. Regarding uh, metformin, doses with stage 3, stage 4, and stage 5. From stage 1 to stage 3, normal dose you can use. In stage 3B onwards, reduce dose to 1, one gram per day. Stage 4 and stage 5 contraindicated. Insulin dose to be adjusted. Regarding SGLT2, stage 3B, canna can be used of maximum 100 milligram. DAPA can be used mostly in the stage 3B. AMPA can be used for 10 milligram, with 10 milligram in stage 3 and stage 4. But in advanced kidney failure, these drugs are not recommended. GLP-1 receptor agonist can be used. No dose adjustment required in patient with CKD. Regarding DPP-4 inhibitor, as we know that linagliptin, no dose adjustment required. And uh, Pheldagliptin we do use, but uh, in advanced uh, kidney failure should not use. Sulfonuria, limiparate again, you have to reduce the dose of maximum to one milligram. And they are notorious to cause hypoglycemia. You can use glipizides. Glitazone, no dose adjustment required, but only problem with that glitazone is the heart failure. And uh, acarbogenol in the initial stage, no dose adjustment required, but in advanced stages, not recommended. Coming to the uh, two drugs normally recommended for patients with diabetic nephropathy, one is metformin, other one is SGLT2 inhibitor. Now, suppose patient is treatment naive, like uh, newly diagnosed diabetes with uh, suppose A1C of around 7.5 and uh, EGFR of around 55 or 60. Now, if asked to choose, between metformin and SGLT2 inhibitor. Which one to be choose? That is the question. Uh, the tagom message is, as uh, metformin is one of the time-tested drugs, is the uh, less expensive, easily available. We do have all faith on metformin. So that first choice of drug, should be metformin if patient can tolerate. And uh, later on, to see the, to get the added effect of cardiovascular and renal protection, we can use SGLT2 inhibitor. Which formulation of metformin to be used? One is immediate release, other one is extended release. With the immediate release, the more problem with the uh, GI problem, having nausea and uh, dyspepsia. And that with extended, if patient develops nausea or uh, dyspepsia following immediate release, we can switch over to extended release. Now, uh, patient with EGFR of more than 60, then we can go for either immediate release or extended release. EGFR of less than 30, initiation should not be done with metformin. EGFR of 30 to 44, Initiate with half dose and gradually tighter to the maximum dose. Regarding vitamin B12 monitoring, uh, data has shown that uh, vitamin B12 deficiency, especially in those who are pure vegetarian, can have with uh, metformin. But normally, it's, uh, it's relation with the time durations. So the vitamin B12 monitoring is required if patient on metformin for long durations. Then annually, vitamin B12 recommended monitoring is required and accordingly you have to supplement. Monitoring kidney function, if patient with normal GFR, it is annually. And if patient is having ESR of less than 60, then we should monitor EGFR in every three to six months. And then if patient is having, is maintaining with that, then uh, we can continue the same dose. And suppose EGFR is Decreasing, then we can halve the dose, and if it is decreased to less than 30, we have to stop the dose. And suppose person is maintaining with EHFR of more than 60, then we have to continue with the same dose of metformin. Regarding SGLT2 inhibitor, so there are three things we have to consider. One is assessment, second one is glycemic control, third one is volume status. Eligible patients, sir, if person is having EHFR or EGFR of uh, ideally should be more than 30. Who should be the patient? 
one is having albuminuria, second one is patient is having evidence of heart failure. Potential contraindication for SGLT2 is infection risks, ketoacidosis, foot ulcer and immunosuppression. Hypoglycemic risk is not there along with SGLT2, but if patient is on insulin and sulfonuria, then they have at high risk for hypoglycemic events. CD volume status, concurrent use of diuretics, patient with heart failure, they are uh, they used to get uh, furosemide or uh, furosemide with lacy lactone, then you have to be cautious regarding volume status. And then uh, accordingly, we have to choose the SGLT2. You can choose either Kana, DAPA, or AMPA. But uh, other uh, things like hypoglycemic symptoms and volume depression symptoms, we have to educate the patients. And uh, on the practical note, uh, I've seen lots of patients, they come with UTI and giddiness with uh, SGLT2 inhibitor. Otherwise, uh, it's a good drug as in the previous lecture it was discussed. Even patient with <coughs> without diabetes can be given SGLT2. Those patients who are at uh, risk for heart failure and uh, chronic kidney disease, the group of patients so here is the uh, dilated cardiomyopathy group of patients. Even if they don't have diabetes, we can use SGLT2 for prevention of renal and further cardiovascular complications. So, it's of SGLT2 should be prioritized in documented kidney and uh, cardiovascular. And it is reasonable to halt SGLT2 during the time of prolonged fasting, surgery, or critical medical illness. They are prone to develop ketoacidosis in those group of patients. A reversible decrease of EGFR with, con com with commencement of SGLT2 may occur generally not an indication to discontinue the therapy. If we start SGLT2, there may be sudden decrease, then you can continue and follow up the patients. Uh, you can continue the SGLT2 even EGFR falls. Is, uh, SGLT2 inhibitor have not been studied in kidney transplant recipients who may be benefit from SGLT2 but are immunosuppression and at risk of increased infection. So these are the different trials on SGLT2, DAPA CKD on kidney failure, can bust on cardiovascular, and then uh, DAPA HCF. So there are different trials on the SGLT2, and they are having composite benefit from heart failure and uh, kidney disease. Regarding GLP2 receptor agonist, uh, one problem here is the cost factor, but uh, definitely they are uh, having cardiovascular advantage they're not hypoglycemic, they don't cause hypoglycemics, hypoglycemic effects. And uh, you should start with low dose of GLP-1 agonist, but it should not be combined with DPP-4 inhibitor. Preferably used in patients with obesity, DM with CKD to promote intestinal weight loss. So these are the different uh, GLP agonists, duraglutide, exodentide, reductite, then uh, semaglutide oral is there, no dose absorption required but uh, limited data on the severe CKD. <laughs> Regarding BP management, already uh, there was discussed, was discussed uh, the target BP should be one th less than 130 by IT, and those who have low risk factor can be considered for less than 140, 90. AC or ARB should be recommended. One concern with AC and ARB is the potassium level. Could we wind up a little faster? Yes, sir. Uh, if patient is having potassium is, uh, Follow-up potassium is normal, then you can continue. If potassium is uh, hyperkalemic, then we can treat the hyperkalemia first. One uh, point here is that if patient develop hyperkalemia following AC inhibitor, you need not, not to stop the AC, AC, uh, AC or ARB. You just treat the hyperkalemia and uh, treat accordingly. Regarding mineralocorticoid receptor antagonists, we have uh, data on the spinal return regarding heart failure but there is a novel class of mineralocorticoid agonist uh, that is uh, phenerenone, which uh, has cardiovascular and renal protective effect. Regarding lipid management, statin is recommended for all patients with type 1 or type 2 diabetes in CKD, and uh, based on the patient's conditions and risk factor, we have to intensify the statin management. 
Regarding lifestyle interventions, protein intake should be 0.8 gram per kg, like in non-diabetic patients. Those with dialysis may be increased to 1.2 to 1.2 gram. Sodium intake ideally should be less than 2 gram per day, and patients should encourage for physical activity. Decreased sodium intake can lead to decreased cardiovascular disease, decreased stroke of, uh, risk of stroke, and decreased progression to CKD. So this one is the holistic approach for management of uh, diabetes and CKD. So we'll go for the lifestyle modifications with healthy diet, physical activity, smoking cessation, and weight management. First line drug, metformin or SGLT2 has to be individualized. Then after that, we can go for RAS inhibitions by AC inhibitor, ARB, or, uh, and you can go for moderate to high dose of statin. If patients, you can maintain with the low targeted hemoglobin uh, A1C and with uh, other cardiovascular risks, blood pressure and lipid, you continue the same medicines. Otherwise, we can add GLP-1 receptor agonist or non steroidal MRI agonist. And uh, if not, we can go for other oral hypoglycemic drugs like uh, sulfonuria, DP4 inhibitor, insulin, based on the patient conditions. To conclude, uh, management of hyperglycemia in CKD patients should focus on the comprehensive care, glycemic monitoring and targets with A1C, lifestyle intervention with smoking seizures on uh, healthy diet, glucose lowering therapies has to be individualized between the metformin and SGLT2 inhibitor. Then uh, approach to management of patients like education, consistent efforts at improving diet and exercise remain foundations, control of risk factors including rest blockade and statin remains part of standard care, glycemia is monitored with A1C and blood glucose glycemic target should be individualized with focus of increased risk of hypoglycemia with decline kidney function, use of both metformin and SGLT2 inhibitor recommended as first line drug of type 2 diabetes mellitus. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. Very nice, a comprehensive review of this difficult topic. The, there's only that last line when you said the first line therapy. Uh, of course, in diabetes will be SGLT2 and metformin. But when you say that in your one of your comments was EGFR was 55. And we would prefer, I mean, that would be my view, prefer to start an SGLT2 to prevent further damage to the kidney and fall in EGFR. So that would be the first line. And then see whether if the patient is tolerating it, there's no contraindication. We can add metformin, but normally with this much of CKD, adding metformin usually Madam, adds uh, to a lot of problems. The recent uh, data guideline from uh, KDGO and ADA, they have shown that there is no high quality data who is comparing metformin versus SGLT2. But as metformin is time tested, it's easily available, less expensive. So their recommendation is go with metformin first, then add on SGL2 later, not the reverse. See, here the patients will come to you after six months <clears throat> or nine months or one year. And in that time, the CKD would have worsened. And second so one is always good that, to put uh, them on the SGL2. Availability and tolerability of the drugs. Yes. SGL2 that cost. And effect if now you the see cost has come down, of course, quite a lot. Now this dapagliflozin is very, very inexpensive. So, I mean, this one, that's why I mean, yes. you have to and individualize the patient. Add on the. So, uh, oh. Most of them they do require mm -hmm. the combination of uh, metformin and. SGLT2 Plus, of course, it has uh, other widespread good effects, SGLT2. And Hepatic, most of them they are at risk for cardiovascular disease. So in those conditions, so definitely. Huh? SGLT2, yeah. And diabetes is, has everything. Yes, so that's why. And of course, metformin is good, but in lower doses. What yes. I've seen prescriptions with 1,000 milligrams twice a day with a creatinine of 1.8 and 2. So I think that should be yes, discouraged. See, one of your slides you have mentioned that in foot also, the SGLT should not be used. Any particular reason? Madam, sir. In one of the slides you have mentioned the SGLT should mm -hmm. not be used in foot ulcers. Patient foot. with foot ulcers. No, man, sir, it's not. It's, it's like a uh, person is having active infection. Yes. Person is having active infection, then in those conditions, SGLT2 inhibitor should be uh, halt for some time till you uh, clear the infection part. Yeah, I mean, acute I, infection. 
say, I would not be able to understand active infection when we are covering with antibiotic, then also one cannot this use. This one is sir, a recommendation from again Kedigo and ADI in 2022. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You test content. Input. There is some, there are some reports of uh, amputation with SGLT2 inhibitor. Maybe okay, that may be the reason. They have not given exactly. Peripheral vascular circulation. Maybe, sir. They have not given the expansion, but could not they have noted. See, SGLT2 inhibitor normally you are starting from 60 and above. And the EGFR is going down. Below 45, the efficacy goes down. Nowadays, I mean, even ADA guidelines were 2023 said, you can go as a anti-hyperglycemic up to 30. But below 30, where you are using it, is basically for renal protection and cardio protection. And should not use below 20. Yes, sir. It's one time. Same thing for, sir, post-renal transplant patient. We don't have data. Any more? Huh. Uh, Madam, we have applied for one uh, project regarding these things because, uh, like uh, Madam was said, we are seeing lots of patients of BP with 170 by 100 and they are quite comfortable. And uh, one thing we have noticed is that patient awareness, like uh, they know that they are having diabetes, they know they are having hypertension, but still they are not taking medicine properly. They know that they will have the problem with kidney and eyes and all, but that uh, awareness is still not there in the rural populations. So, running any outreach with, the, with the help of community medicine, madam, we have started and the help of uh, community medicine and medicine department with the psychiatry department. We have started outreach program to have uh, awareness amongst the people with, uh, because we are having uh, lots of patients with very high blood sugar and very high blood pressure and they are not totally aware of their, not aware today, aware, but they are not taking proper Medicines and uh, so. so I think there is no more questions. We can uh, thank you very much for thank this you. very excellent discussion and program. Thank you. <clears throat>